officer um, in our in our public works department, and she'll be giving kind of an overview of chlorides. Um, and then we'll have Jason Schmidt, who is um, part of our building maintenance team here at the city of Rochester. He'll be diving a little bit deeper into some specific project um, products, as well as what we're piloting here at the city's Development Services and Infrastructure Center for a chloride-free winter maintenance this year. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat and we can address them. We'll also leave a little bit of time at the end for questions too. And as a reminder, this is recorded, so it will share the presentation after the fact. With that, I will hand it over to Sadie. Well, thank you very much. As Lauren said, my name is Sadie and I'm a Minnesota Green Corps member. I started working with Stephanie in September and my current term will go through August. I'm working on behavior change concerning chloride pollution, pet waste, urban water education, inclusive community engagement. Uh, and this summer I'll be conducting green infrastructure assessments and continuing to serve on a number of boards and committees and generally helping Stephanie with all of the collaborations that she comes up with. Um, in addition to this presentation, if you would like to see more of the work that we're doing or things that we're talking about today, you should make sure to put into your calendar the Earth Fest, which will be on April 30th, and we are partnering with the Farmers Market, so it'll be at the fairgrounds. All right, so today I will be talking about chlorides and you. So first, Minnesota has a growing salty water problem. Uh, chlorides from sources including de-icers, water softeners, fertilizers, and death suppressants all get into our lakes, streams, and groundwater, which threatens the health of fish, macroinvertebrates, and things that live in our waters, as well as the quality of our drinking water. Here is a little pie chart that shows the number of sources of chloride, and it's quite a few, but as shown, the winter de-icers and road salt is the largest source and accounts for more than 40% of chloride pollution in our water. So how does the salt get into our lakes, streams, and groundwater? We have an MS4 system, which just means that our storm drains do not go to our water treatment plant. Our storm drains go straight into our local waterways. And here, I'm trying to show that the more uh, dense urban area that we have, the more buildings, the more roofs, the more sidewalks and streets, the less water can infiltrate into the ground and the more runs off into those storm drains and into our waterways. So what are chlorides and salts? They are mostly used for our, de-icing de is the most common use for them on our roads and found in the stores where you can buy. They work at differing temperatures to break the bonds in ice and can commonly be found in mixes to be able to address a wider variety of temperatures. Uh, here, most commonly used, we have sodium chloride, which is probably the one you know the best as rock salt. It's also table salt in just a less refined form. But sometimes you will also find either on its own or in a mix, calcium chloride, potassium chloride, and magnesium chloride. And what are chloride-free salts and de-icers? Chloride alternatives are often marketed as environmentally friendly or child and pet safe, and they too can come in mixes to expand their working temperature range, but the majority of them are either a kind of urea, a formate, an acetate, or a glycol. And don't worry, Jason will go into much more detail about this. So chloride pollution. It is considered a permanent pollutant because reverse osmosis is the only current technology capable of treating this kind of contamination. However, if you know what reverse osmosis is, it's very expensive. And so far it's only being considered to be added on to drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment, not for something that we can use to treat just our lakes and, and streams where aquatic uh, life is. And here, uh, we really hope that this is one thing that you will take home after this, is that it only takes a teaspoon of salt to permanently pollute five gallons of water. So what are some of the issues that these chlorides uh, cause? One of the big ones um, 
that we are trying to address also at our demo site that Jason will talk about is corrosion. It causes uh, corrosion on road surfaces, bridges, accelerates pothole formation and damages reinforcing rods on property, your personal property included. Chloride causes rust on our vehicles and damages cement driveways, stairs, walkways and foundations, especially if they were poured less than six months ago. And in 2017, the Twin Cities metro area published their total annual expenditures and damage costs of approximately $350 million to $1.2 billion being attributed to just salt. It also causes issues. For soil and vegetation, if you look out to the for a windbreak um, or even in neighborhood areas, you might see some that are are dead where salt spray has just landed on the outside of it, but it up through their roots. It was a better picture of the, and I hope that everybody will start to notice this more often as you're out and about, especially this time of year. Um, we also know that of course it causes issues for our beautiful grass. Um, but chlorides in the streams, lakes, and wetlands also harm aquatic vegetation and change the plant community structure. And that loss of root structure on our terrestrial vegetation can lead to soil erosion. Additionally, salt-laden soil can lose its ability to retain water and store nutrients and be more prone to erosion again. And erosion itself leads to sediment runoff, which is also a pollutant in our waters. It Sadie, also affects pets and wildlife. Sadie, um, I had a quick question for you. Um, yeah. A couple of things. Your audio is a little choppy. Do you mind going or oh, trying no. going off video for a second to see if that helps the bandwidth piece of it? Yeah. And then we did have a question in the chat too, as you were moving through some of the salt impacts around. Um, so why not use sand for roads only instead of including salt if there's these impacts from using salt? Can you say it again? Oh, I can I can open the chat. Uh, why so not, why not use, use sand? Oh, so sand, great question, uh, is only used for traction, not for breaking those bonds uh, between the roads and the ice that forms on it. And so at certain temperatures, when salts or other de-icers don't work, the only option is to use sand to try and increase safety and, and get some traction there. However, uh, like I was talking about with all that erosion of the soil, sand itself is a pollutant as well. And so we don't wanna just toss sand out there whenever we can, because that sand will also wash away into those storm drains that go straight into our waterways. All right. So pets and wildlife, um, I did not put the horrible picture in here for you to see of that beautiful little pup with its feet all bandaged up. Um, but I'm sure some dog owners know that salts can really hurt your pet's paws. In addition, wildlife, birds and animals like deer, they eat the salt. Um, people put salt licks out. So we know that animals need salt, especially in the winter. However, when they ingest salt like this, it's incredibly toxic to them. Not only can it kill them, but also as we saw in the vegetation slide, it will uh, damage their habitat. All right. Now this slide, surface waters, is my area of expertise, um, but it's also a serious environmental concern. So scientists who study freshwater lakes and streams have begun referencing this chloride pollution as freshwater salinization syndrome. So if you see FSS somewhere around, it's the same thing that we're talking about today. It's a big deal because influxes of saline water from roads treated with de-icers can alter the density structure or what's called stratification of those lakes. That can delay or halt seasonal turnover events, which happen as the air temps warm or cool and are important for the nutrient cycling within those lakes. That lack of turnover during the fall or spring can result in persistently anoxic hypolimnia, which just means that water at the bottom section of the lake where the nutrients from leaf litter and dead plankton settle down can become oxygen deficient. 
Under those conditions, when the lakes don't turn over and replenish that oxygen and distribute those nutrients, lakes have the potential to produce large accumulations of methane in that zone, which is not only not normal for the fish and critters that live there, but it can also increase greenhouse gas emissions from urban lakes. Also important in these fresh waters is the stress uh, that's caused by increased chlorides. That stress on the fish, aquatic bugs, and amphibians may not immediately kill those organisms, especially if it's just chronic, uh, but it often leads to stunted growth and population decline since all their energy is just going into surviving under those harsh conditions. Now, groundwater. The chronic standard for chloride, uh, for, sorry, <laughs> within groundwater, salt has contaminated it in uh, mostly dense urban areas. 75% of Minnesotans rely on groundwater for our drinking water, like Rochester does, and excess salt could affect the taste and healthfulness of drinking water. Uh, excess salt is dangerous for people who have high blood pressure, and at about 230 milligrams per liter, you can start to taste it. So where in the state is this happening? Uh, we're not entirely sure because we've only just started testing for this. It's kind of like an emerging contaminant. Uh, road salt runoff road salt runoff tends to be a problem in developed areas where there are many roads and other paved surfaces. Chloride in wastewater appears to be a problem in almost 90 Minnesota communities, which in the southern and western parts of the state is where it's most prevalent. Uh, the Pollution Control Agency water monitoring shows that salt concentrations are increasing in lakes and streams and groundwater all around the state, though. This map shows only waters in the state that have been evaluated so far, and bodies of water without a colored label do not have any data available. And what about Rochester? If we zoom in, this purple area are where the lakes and streams within this area are likely to be impaired by chlorides. This model is based on road density alone, which was found to be the single best predictor of chloride contamination in the Twin Cities metro area. Rochester has a new monitoring cycle coming up, and Stephanie and I have had some great conversations with MPCA about the potential for chloride monitoring in our community to help us better understand our local water conditions. So what can we do? What are the solutions? Since we can't treat our water yet, we know that we need to work on preventing increased pollution. And next, I'll tell you about how the city of Rochester is working to help decrease our own contributions and help residents to also adopt new preventative behavior. So Rochester Winter Salting, our new program, is a community-based social marketing program. And that is just behavior change instead of purely education. It differs in a little bit of a way um, by instead of just creating education and having presentations or engagement events, we instead do a little bit of research within there to identify benefits and barriers. And importantly, we have to pick a non-divisible action, which we chose as just salting properly. So community-based social marketing has this cycle to it. You select your behavior to promote. And since we needed that, that fundamental action, something that can't be broken into any more steps, we chose that to be smart salting rather than um, trying to ask people to buy something new and use it. It's use the same thing you have, just do it better, keeping it simple. The next, we identify benefits and barriers to that behavior. Uh, with this, we used surveys and consultants to do analysis, to, uh, to do some statistics that are a bit over my head to identify the most effective campaign actions. And that is where we will develop our strategies. And then instead of rolling it out to the entire community as a whole, we go through pilot testing, and then you implement community-wide. So this is a phrase that I heard in uh, Dan's presentation uh, when he talked about roads. He said, this is a typical mindset of most people in Minnesota. When in doubt, put it out. And our goal within addressing this chloride pollution is to help change the community's mindset from when in doubt, put it out, 
to scatter matters. Asking someone to buy a hand spreader or research and buy a new product are both multi-step or multi-ask campaigns. By showing people how to use the tools they are already familiar with, we are only making one ask of them. And when we encourage them to think about the fact that scatter matters. So right now we have done our research and the majority of our survey findings for the residential salting pilot are that most people use a cup or just their hand to scatter salt. And the majority of residents also care about water quality. So with our pilot, we are doing pre and post surveys with the specific neighborhoods that we've picked out. We are delivering smart salting kits, which include some of that educational literature, but also a cup that just has uh, the handy information and instruction on it on how to properly salt, um, along with some other stickers that they can help just to remind them again that scatter matters. To get people to participate, we are using prizes for a winter equipment drawing and to try and help spread the word because we know that one on one interaction is the best way to encourage better behavior. We are hoping to bring together a neighborhood ambassador program. The business survey, our most important findings are that it was a nearly even split whether people uh, do the salting themselves or hire out. They are very concerned about liability and most do not know about the smart salting certifications, which I'll tell you about in a bit. So pilot, same thing, pre and post surveys, smart salting kits to help them do it right and remind them how to do it, prizes and having ambassadors. So what can you do? You can change the status quo. You can winterize your expectations Think about who is responsible for what level of service. Think about what needs to be done to balance the environmental benefits along with your safety benefits. Think about how you can be mindful, walking where you look, slowing down, whether that's driving or, or walking anywhere, and doing what you can to uh, uh, be prepared when you go outside. Next, you can winterize your property. Make annual gutter maintenance part of your fall routine and install permeable pavement, especially if you have a problem with pooling water and ice formation. A recent study showed that the annual median ice and snow cover on porous pavement was three times lower than that of regular pavement. And that the low amounts of ice and snow accumulating on porous pavement led to a 77% reduction in annual salt used for maintenance. Next, gear up. Although your trusty plastic shovel might work most of the time, you may find that manual removal can do more than you think. Your local hardware store is likely to carry a variety of push shovels, scoop shovels, ice chisels, and ice scrapers. There are many types of snow, slush, and ice, so having a couple of different tools on hand means that you'll always be prepared for any job. Next, make it fun for you and your family. Get the whole gang involved or use the opportunity to don your favorite costume, which I'm so sorry I've realized is covered up right now. This was actually a picture uh, that was presented by uh, a Rochester resident taken by a snowplow driver. Um, you can also be vocal about the demand for a plow naming campaign. Next, you can support local ordinances at the, or any ordinance, at the local level, look for the council initiated action from council member Kirkpatrick regarding smart salting certification requirements. And at the state level, look for these similar requirements happening today. Next, spread the word that one-on-one -on -one is the best way to encourage behavior from someone else. So talk to your friends, your family, your neighbors and coworkers about chlorides and smart salting. And lastly, get in touch. Let's talk about what it means to be a smart salting ambassador for either you to your neighborhood or you as a business person in town or both. So the smart salting certification that I've been talking about, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has four different certifications. Some of these are for professionals, those who are contracted to take care of parking lots and sidewalks, those who take care of our roads, property managers, and then uh, this level two certification is for people who want to take it to the next level and go more in depth 
with uh, all of their planning of how much salt to use. If you don't have time for these things because they do take about half a day and maybe you are not one of these professionals, you can also check out the salting mini course program that was made by another Green Corps member in Minneapolis. And I will put the link to that later. All right, additionally, what you can do is to share these links that I will put in or share, and I will share a link to this video since I'm running low on time, but sharing resources. And lastly, practice smart salting. Remember that scatter matters. Try to, when you spread salt, make sure that your granules are about three inches apart. Make sure that you shovel first. Manual removal is important. Select the right product, use the right de-icer, know the temperature outside, scatter properly. And lastly, after the storm has gone and your uh, walkways are clear and dry, sweep up whatever is left over so it doesn't go down the storm drain. And here's where we switch over to Jason. This uh, little table here is trying to help you identify that right stuff so you know what to use based on your temperature, based on uh, whether you're pre-treating for a storm or whether it's after a storm. And I'll pass it over to Jason to pick it up here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Let's see if I can get my screen going here. Okay, so like Sadie said, I'm going to take over and move through the alternative options to our traditional chloride salts. Um, here at the Development Services and Infrastructure Center, which is also the North Police Station, uh, we have begun a pilot program uh, using chloride-free winter maintenance de-icer material and products. Uh, so, a comparison of products that are available, um, things you may or may not know about. This is a wonderful study done by the Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, between 2014 and 2017. Um, they did a comprehensive study of the effects of traditional salts, traditional fluoride salts, and these alternative non-fluoride products. Um, the products that we are using here at the Development Services Center is these acetates and formates. Um, acetates and formates are, by all definition, they are still a salt. They are chloride-free salts. Um, glycols are a highly manufactured chemical uh, that we try not to use. Um, and then succinates is a product that at the time of this research study, we're still very new and there was very little information because the products are not made on an industrial scale. So their availability was quite limited. Since then, there has been more studies. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so on this graph, uh, yellow boxes are bad. And if you look at chlorides, uh, chlorides have the most yellow boxes. Um, acetates and formates, um, they have notable information, um, but their they're worst quality is their immediate cost. Um, and at the time of this study between 2014 and 17, um, their costs were quite high. Since then, the, the cost of material has come down quite a lot. Uh, current supply chain issues, like most other products right now, have driven the cost up of those materials. Um, it is expected to be just a temporary cost hike um, once supply chains can get worked out cost should come back down. Um, something I want to note about succinates, uh, since this study, the University of Mon Montana has done a more comprehensive research um, based off of this MnDOT research. And something that they learned, which I think is really neat about succinates, is that the succinate material is, comes in a liquid form. So if you took your salt and mixed it into a big jug of water, uh, which a lot of properties such as the Mayo Clinic are doing here around Rochester. And sometimes you'll see the public works vehicles driving around with sprayers on the back of the trucks. 
Most often that is spreading a salt brine solution, a typical fluoride salt brine solution. And what the University of Montana learned is this succinate product as a 2% additive, so 98% salt water and 2% of the succinate reduced um, corrosion to uh, ferrous metals by 40%. Um, so again, it's, it's not a widely available product yet, but if there was any product that has a really high impact at a really low material cost, uh, I think succinates is something really exciting to keep an eye on for the future. Um, so Sadie showed this similar screen. Um, this is why we care as a facilities and property department. Uh, we are responsible for a whole lot of sidewalks and a whole lot of parking lots. And as we know, as we've learned through pollution control agency programs, uh, road salt is the highest pollutant of our waters when it comes to chloride. And we are responsible for putting that material out there. So what we know is we put it out there and it ends up in our water and it sticks around. And to put that in perspective, the Twin City Metro area did a study um, of how much salt they use per season. So to do the quick math on the U of M study and the DOT and all those studies, quick math on it is the 349,000 tons of salt that the Twin City Metro area uses pollutes roughly 217 billion gallons of water per year. So like Sadie had mentioned that one teaspoon for per five gallons, just the Twin City Metro area in their road salt use has a massive impact on our waters. Um, to put that 217 billion gallons into perspective, that is roughly three and a half days worth of water that goes over Niagara Falls. Um, that's just, that, that's a massive amount of water. Um, and like Sadie had also mentioned, there is no real cost effective way to remove the chlorides. So we as users of the material and responsible for safe winter maintenance, we care because we are putting it out there, we know it's going into the water and we don't have a way, an effective way to you know, correct the problem that we are creating. So we have piloted this program to um, try to do better. So what can we do? We as an organization and we as individual citizens at home, we have options. Um, these are products that are available retail at most of your local retailers, uh, whether they are available on the shelf or by order, they can come right to our door. We, most of us have Come, become quite familiar with that service and enjoy it. And these products, I, I have the first product on there, the four gallons of calcium fluoride. I have that as a comparison, four gallons of a liquid de-icer, which is described as the most effective use of chlorides is about $60. So the next product at five gallons of non-fluoride de-icer, your cost per gallon is really, really close. If you have one of those little pump sprayers to go around and spray your yard or, or to spray your flowers in, in flower season, um, this material can go in that same sprayer, can go on your sidewalks and driveways in the same manner. And most of those sprayers are at such a low flow that they're actually already applying the proper amount. So you know, most people already have the equipment to use a liquid product. And if you don't, um, there are plenty of these products that come in granular form. Um, you know, a lot of us have bags of salt and have had bags of salt or a bucket of salt by our door for years and years. And uh, these shaker bottles in the bottom right corner have become quite popular. And this is a fluoride-free shaker bottle product by Cryotech which is a very large industrial manufacturer of chloride-free winter maintenance material. Um, they have had issues getting that product onto store shelves, but it is available for order. It comes four to a case, four 10 pound, 10 pound shakers to a case for about $150. Um, 
Unfortunately, that cost is driven by shipping right now. There's a large shipping cost to those materials right now. But once they get on the shelves, um, it's expected to be right around 80 80 ish dollars for a for 40 pound case. Um, again, I am a big supporter of the liquid options. Uh, liquid options going on pre or post treat are very effective. Um, if you want to see some really cool information about that, Mayo Clinic has a lot of information available on their salt brine liquid solutions. Okay. So, Though you can get a lot of really awesome products available retail, I caution you, um, there are no regulations on the packaging for better products on any fluoride free products or fluoride products in general. Um, so like this product here sells for about a, a dollar a pound, which is pretty similar to the cost of most fluoride free products. And looking at the package, it says all the keywords, all the hot topic words that draw people in, that make it seem like just a fantastic product. And when you flip the bag over, which I couldn't get a picture of the back of the bag, but I have the safety data sheet. What's in that bag is just potassium fluoride. And like Sadie had mentioned, potassium fluoride, just like any other fluoride product, is not pet safe, is not environmentally friendly. You know, it is not most of the claims on that bag about the only thing that is real is powerful and melt. So be careful, though those products exist on the shelf at the store, take that extra 10 seconds to turn the box around or flip the bag over and read the contents of the bag because that is required to be on the bag. So every package will tell you what's actually in the bag regardless of what the front of the package says. So, Commercially, like we are doing here at the Development Services Center, um, there are just an exploding number of commercial companies that are, are making products available. Um, there is a very large brand in the middle of that page that happens to be what we are using at this site. Um, that, that product is um, used quite a lot in this area. Um, it has some unique attributes to its um, formation that make it uh, really useful for our part of the country where we have high winds. Um, it sticks really well when it's spread. Um, you know, a lot of products that go through spreaders like we use commercially uh, tend to hit the ground and bounce and roll away and end up in the dirt or in the grass. Uh, so like those pictures Sadie was showing of the burnt grass and the burnt trees, when you want the material to stay where you need it to reduce the effects on the environment, you know, directly by burning the grass and the trees with fluorides, um, a material that's designed to hit the ground and stay exactly where it is, is really important. So we have actually found an efficiency increase with that product too, because we're not losing so much of it to run off and blow away. Um, but some of these other products, uh, bottom left, Cryotech, um, that was the one that has the 10 pound shaker bottles. Uh, the one next to it, Entry. Entry has started getting their product onto the shelf for retail sale. Um, Entry is a very interesting liquid product for anyone who would like to experience the joys of liquid de-icing. Um, one that I think is really cool is the one next to that, Hawkins. Hawkins Chemicals is actually produced out of the refinery up on Highway 52 in Rosemont. Um, that refinery itself has won a lot of awards in its sustainability efforts and its, um, its programs and its manufacturing of, um, you know, better. And Hawkins Chemicals is one of the companies that operates out of there and they create quite a few commercially available fluoride free products. So it's really cool that we have one right in our backyard that you know is doing this. Um, so the big question that I know everyone wants to know is can we afford these products? Um, well, the product we're using, that first one on there, picture on the right, 
uh, comes out to about $2,600 a metric ton. And that sounds like a lot. And what drives that cost up more than a lot of other products is its combination of acetate and formate. Um, acetates and formates are naturally occurring. They are mixed with sodium in this case to create a salt crystal, um, which is why they are technically salts, but they are fluoride free. And the formate product is less commonly found. So the formate is driving most of that cost. Cryotech, the largest producer of fluoride free products. Um, Cryotech formerly was a division of um, Chevron. So Chevron Chemical Group created a, a chemical company that has now divided and become Cryotech. Um, and they've been creating these fluoride free products for almost 40 years. So these are not new. Um, they have the mass scale and ability to create their products at a lower cost because they can afford the manufacturing equipment for raw materials. Um, most of these commercial products like this from these commercial dealers um, have you know, quite large minimum orders, um, but I still look at these in, in a very viable way for things like our homeowners associations. Uh, we have quite a few of them around this city and you know, getting uh, HOA on board to buy one pallet of this material, you know, <clears throat> true cost to the homeowner um, becomes quite affordable. You know, the same mentality applies with this material or chloride salt that scatter matters. Your, your use of the material is very important. And every one of these products for the mo most part will have a, a use guide on the back of the package. And using the product by design, you'll be surprised how much less material you have and how much longer that bag of material will last. Uh, so like this 40 pound bag would come out to about $50 a bag. Um, but by following that application guide, that bag will probably last the average homeowner several snow events uh, just by doing their sidewalk and, and driveway. On the scale of the city, if we were to do this through our standard street maintenance program, you take our typical truck, fill it to the brim with this material versus fluoride salt, and you're talking about $14,000 per run with that truck. And that sounds like it an astronomical number to put in the back of the truck and literally throw out onto the roads. But if you take into account the actual cost of salt, like Sadie was mentioning with um, the corrosive nature of salt, um, the MnDOT study I referenced earlier has put together some real true costs of using salt, the damage to infrastructure and equipment and when you take into account those costs, um, you know, your average between high and low cost of infrastructure damage, we're already spending that. That those costs average out to almost $14,000. And the things that never get quantified in these studies is the cost of the damage to our wildlife and our environment. Um, another cost that Sadie had mentioned was the extreme cost of reverse osmosis systems. They are being looked at on industrial scales, but like she said, it, they're not being looked at to, you know, set next to a river or next to a lake and, and treat the lakes and rivers. They are only being looked at for drinking water solutions. So the massive amount of costs that will someday be required if we continue to use fluoride salts can't really be quantified because we can't even imagine the scale that these systems would be needed up to you know, reverse the damage to our, our lakes and rivers. So uh, Sadie had mentioned you know, getting involved with city ordinances and trying to make policies on the local level um, to think that that is, you know, an idea of the future 
it's really not. So the the US DOT and FAA have had these regulations in place since 2008. Um, they became a formal regulation 13 years ago for all airports in North in the United States that operate a thousand flights a year or more. But in reality, most airports in the US have been operating this way for 25 years or more. Um, airlines decided a long time ago that salt was wrecking their planes. Uh, airports decided it was wrecking their um, runways and their you know, terminals. So these products, primarily from Cryotech at the time, um, became available and their anti-corrosion and their non-corrosive nature, their anti-corrosion inhibitors and their, their non-corrosive um, design um, really became popular in an, in an industry that is uh, highly dependent on safety of equipment. Um, so, you know, some of these things are very specific to um, the, the industry, the air industry, um, but, you know, minor tweaks to the language in here and these same regulations that have been in place, the, the legal legwork has been done on them, you know, changing the language and, and having them proposed to our local municipality wouldn't be terribly difficult. Um, you know, they make some bold statements in these regulations that, you know, these chemicals are known to be corrosive and therefore are prohibited. You know, putting language like that in our local ordinances, in my opinion, would be absolutely fantastic to see. And knowing that these products are out there and available, um, you know, it's just, the will and the desire to choose them. So how do chlorides compare? Uh, Sadie had mentioned that chlorides are extremely widely used. They are the most common de-icer in Minnesota and, and the US. Um, that has been the product that has always been available. Um, they are still the most common de-icer because of their cost. And Sadie had mentioned the different you know, uh, formulas of chloride salts. And that gives salt the advantage of a wide range of working temperatures. So you can get the product that is best suited for your area or for a specific snow event. But as we know now, chloride salts make our water salty. And our freshwater environment here in Minnesota does not uh, cope well with salt water. So along its way, the salt water is affecting our entire environment around us. And we know salts to be very corrosive, fluoride salts. Um, back on that original slide with all the yellow boxes, acetate formates and succinate salts, they are becoming more popular. They are finally making their way onto retail shelves. And much like fluoride salts, they have quite a range of effective temperatures. So as far as effectiveness, they they check the same box. Um, the, the best boxes of acetate, formate, and succinate is that they biodegrade. Um, acetates and formates have about a 48 hour uh, timeline before they are degraded to a point where they show little to no effect on the environment around them. So if you're thinking about our MS4 system here where our storm waters go from parking lot to stream, if it takes 48 hours or more for that, that water to go from parking lot to stream, that material is already degraded to the point where it is no longer going to have an effect on our stream. Along its way, it will affect the water that it is in, but by the time it gets to the river, it is not going to affect that river anymore. Also, the acetate formate and succinates all have corrosion inhibitors and even by themselves show very little corrosive effects. Downside, they cost more. Um, like any new technology, the new tech always comes at a cost. But as it becomes more popular, they, the cost comes down. We drive the market, and as the market you know, gets you know, consumed by us, we can drive the market cost of these materials down. 
Um, and like I was saying, as these products break down in water or in the environment in general, they consume a lot of oxygen. And the hope is that before it gets to our rivers, it is biodegraded and it is done doing that. Um, so acetates and formates, another fun note, MinDOT, our state's DOT system has installed quite a lot of uh, what looks like a sprinkler system. There are little sprinkler heads that pop up out of the bridges and they typically contain a potassium acetate or potassium formate liquid. And when there's snow or ice events, these sprinklers pop out ahead of time, spray the bridge and keep the bridges from icing. And they're just a really neat, simple tank system with a small pump and it reads, you know, it gets triggered by some sophisticated system back at MnDOT, I'd imagine. And these sprinklers pop out of the roadway and spray the bridge and, and make the road maintenance guys jobs a heck of a lot easier. Um, for airports, acetates and formates have been the primary product used at airports for the better part of two decades now. Um, they are also required on large portions of airport properties. Um, Suconates have been given a uh, experimental basis at airports. I do not know of any road maintenance systems that are using Suconates, but there are uh, a few handfuls of airports around the country that are, are experimenting with the Suconates and how they affect pavement and infrastructure. So Sadie had also mentioned there's other ways that salt get into our waters. Uh, so for those of you at home, there are things we can do. Uh, Salt-based water softening. Um, people think of it highly as you know the silky feel and the lathering of the soap, um, but it is literally just pouring salt water down a drain. Every time you turn on the faucet or the shower, it is salt water going down a drain, which goes to our water treatment plants and is not treated. Um, there are products out there that have the uh, designed effects of salt-based water softening, um, where this lime and scale buildup is not an issue. Um, there are salt-free technologies out there. Um, the most common one is like this product in the top right. It's a media-based product. There are versions out there that are electricity based or magnet based that have very, very little uh, good science on their effectiveness. Um, but there are you know, solutions out there that reduce the amount of chloride use in the average household. One would be water softening. Uh, one of the other most common problem, well, let me back up. As we produce more chlorides in our system, Sadie had mentioned these reverse osmosis systems in the bottom right, that would be the type of system that the city of Rochester would need uh, just to address our drinking water. We would need about 30 of those units at two plus million dollars per unit. Um, in the top middle, that is the at-home version that many of you have probably seen. Those are retail available. If you have noticed a uh, distinct salty taste to your tap water, um, that reverse osmosis system would be an in-home kit for a single faucet. That is not a whole house system. Um, but like she had said too, our, our water treatment plants are not designed currently to, to address this. So one of the other kinds common at-home uses of chlorides is your fertilizer. Most of your on-shelf fertilizers are potassium uh, chloride, which is potassium salt, just like that uh, package that was very poorly labeled that I showed you earlier of the environmental friendly uh, de-icer. Uh, it's just in a different shape and form, but Potassium chloride is de-icer and it is fertilizer and it is in Gatorade. Uh, it is incredibly common and it is a uh, huge, huge contributor to our chloride issues in our environment. 
Um, if you are, if you have a green thumb and you do some of those practices at home, um, I would encourage you to look at uh, sulfate of potash, which is sulfur and potassium. It is a fertilizer that is just as effective as um, standard potash, potassium fluoride, um, has a slightly higher cost, but has absolutely no fluoride or, a, or very, very, very little fluoride. And one thing I would like to note is if we are already putting this much fluoride in our soils from road salt, and it's already in our waters that we are irrigate, irrigating our fields with, um, I really have to wonder how much more fluoride our fields can take if we continue using things like potassium fluoride as a fertilizer. So that is my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you both so much for joining us today and presenting. Um, I'll leave it if there are any other questions for Sadie or Jason. I know we've had a lot in the chat, so thanks for all the activity. I also brought over uh, the cup. Oh, can you see it? Uh, the Scatter Matters cup. Oh, I can turn off my background. Um, but on here, it just reminds people to shovel first. Uh, and that one scoop is about 12 ounces or one pound of salt. And you should only need three scoops or less for your average two car driveway. Um, these are the stickers. I'll take my background off. These are... <laughs> None, there we go. These are the stickers to be a smart salter. This can go on your shovel or on your bucket and little window clings to show all your neighbors that you're a smart salter. Edward, did you have a question? Um, yes, um, we put in a, a demand water softener, but the products that we dump in, uh, are there anything that we can use that's better than the yellow bags we get at the big box stores? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, not that I'm aware of. So I think just improving to an on-demand system is already going to improve your efficiency. So that's great. Like that is the ideal first step. Um, it has been theorized with these uh, fluoride-free de-icer products that because they are still bound with potassium or sodium and they have not been tested at a level that is able to be released to the public yet, but they are testing these products that because they are still bound with sodium and potassium, that they would have a similar effect to water softener salt. Um, that is not a study that they can produce enough information on to show that it, it's safe yet to do that with. Um, but they are also testing these deicer, chloride-free deicer acetates and formates as fertilizers because they are still containing the potassium and things that um, we want from typical fluoride salt combinations. Um, they are testing the expansion of these products into other systems like water softening and fertilizing. Um, every year that 40 pound bag I have to take to the basement gets heavier. Um, can we find a study that really can convince us to move to those magnetic or, or non uh, granular based softening systems. I can try to find the study that I believe it was New Mexico did on the media based uh, chloride free softening. Um, I, I will try to give that information to Kevin to be added to this when it gets posted. Um, the media based one, 
uses no you know bags of salt or anything it does not plug in it uses no electricity um so i i will try to give that information to kevin and companies in town that install such things yep and i did see your question edward in the chat about can this material be swept up and reused um, much like your chloride based salts, um, once they have begun their process of dissolution with the precipitation, it really depends on uh, pavement temperature, ambient temperature, how much uh, precipitation was remaining at the point of dissolution. If it is remaining in a solid form, yes, it can be swept up and reused. It will tend to clump just like your regular chloride salt would, but that doesn't you know, change its effectiveness. So yes, the material can be swept up and reused. Any other questions for our presenters? Right. Well, hearing that, thank you, Jason, Sadie, and Stephanie for monitoring the chat and the presentation. It was awesome. And all the materials that were shared um, might be information overload for a few, but I'm digging into them as we speak. So thank you.